Right. So, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's seminar with the IET Devon and Cornwall Local Network. My name is Sam Duffield, and I'm joined here with Jonathan Ellis, who will introduce himself shortly, for a seminar on Jonathan's journey to incorporated engineer status. Uh, this team's presentation will be recorded and uploaded to the IET Devon and Cornwall YouTube channel, which will be posted in the chat at the end of this session if you'd like to view some of our other seminars. Uh, please post any questions that you may have during Jonathan's presentation, and I'll field those questions to John at the end of his presentation. Um, before we move on to Jonathan, I'd just like to cover a little bit about the IET. The IET is a registered charity which is dedicated to the career development of engineers, funnily enough, working in technology. The Institute of Engineering and Technology is multidisciplinary, meaning we're not just comprised of electrical, electronic and robotics engineers, but we're also civil, chemical, mechanical, biological, nuclear, naval, the list goes on. I represent the Young Professionals Network for Devon and Cornwall and sit on a national level to represent Devon and Cornwall across the United Kingdom. Today's seminar is brought to you by the Devon and Cornwall's Young Professionals Network, who are a ragtag bunch of young engineers and scientists who are all, like Jonathan, consistently looking for professional development opportunities. If you'd like to get involved in the Young Professionals Committee and, and be part of some of all be part of organising some of these exciting events that you can see on the screen here. Please drop me an email, which you can see on the slide, and uh, get in touch either during or after the presentation. So on to today's seminar. Uh, today, Jonathan will be sharing his experience of professional registration and becoming registered as an incorporated engineer. For those of you in attendance not in the know, there are three categories of professional registration. It is important to note that all three categories are different. Categories span from engineering technicians, which may be those of, who have completed an apprenticeship or have experienced working on their tools, or incorporated and chartered engineers who have years of development and accountable experience in the management or enhancement of engineering applications and technology. Importantly, and the IET have done some studies on this, being professionally registered opens up more career opportunities, which ultimately means more money and a pay rise. And who here doesn't want that? Devon and Cornwall is geographically the IET's biggest local network region and one of the biggest regions for potential applicants of engineering technicians for tradespersons, fitters, turners, leading hands and FLMs in the region. Please, please, after this presentation, talk to your line manager or FLM about professional registration or get in touch with your IAT representative for a PRA, Professional Registration Advisor, to find out more. For those of you on the call that are Babcock employees, you may wish to get in contact with Richard Chance to talk about professional re uh, registration. Alternatively, drop me an email, and my email was, was on the previous slide, and I can always steer you in the right direction myself. So without further ado, I'd like to pass on to Jonathan, who will introduce himself. So John, I'm going to stop sharing screens, and are you okay to then share screens? Yes, hopefully. That should be being displayed now. Yes, yes. brilliant. You can see the slideshow then. Yeah, all good. Perfect. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. So, like Salem said, I'm Jonathan Ellis. I work here within Babcock at Devonport Dockyard within the Weapons Systems Engineering Group. I've been with Babcock for approximately seven years and finished my apprenticeship back in 2018. So, today I'm just going to outline quickly what I'm going to cover. So, I'm going to cover my route to engineering and my background and how I got into engineering. I'm then going to move on to the UK spec, how I used the UK spec to aid my application, how I met all the points. I'm going to talk through my application itself and how the PRAs, the professional registration advisors, assist you with the application process. The next stage is the development action plan, accountability diagram, endorsements and supporters, which all form part of your application. So I'll quickly cover all of those throughout my presentation. I'll then move on to the application progress timeline, so the stages of the application. Finally, the PRI, which is the interview. 
So I'll cover a few interview tips that I used and got told. Sorry, I'm having mouse trouble. OK, so a little bit about my background into engineering and so you can relate to whatever careers you're in yourself. So I've always had an interest in engineering, whether it be electrical or mechanical in various sectors, including automotive, marine, which I'm working in now, and agricultural. So I went through sixth form and school the normal route, did my A-levels and then not wanting to go into university, the standard route. So I chose to do a higher apprenticeship. So looking throughout higher apprenticeships within Devon, there was only really Babcock and one other competitive company that guaranteed a higher apprenticeship. I started my apprenticeship age 18 back in 2014 and completed it within 2018. Part of my apprenticeship included a foundation degree in electrical electronic engineering and also an MVQ level four, which other apprentices may be able to use through for their application for iEng. I know I certainly refer to my MVQ as part of my evidence base for my application. And also the write-ups that you used. So as an apprentice, we had three to eight month placements in various sections around the yard. So this will relate to apprentices and graduates that can use these different uh, placements to utilize to have hit all the key points within the UK spec, giving you situations, scenarios and examples to use within your application. So as I moved around the placements, I then managed to settle within the weapon systems engineering group. And after my finish of my apprenticeship, I did the final year at Plymouth University to top up my foundation degree to a BSc honours degree in electrical electronic engineering within one year of completing my apprenticeship. Throughout this time, I also worked on my commissioning workbook because after finishing an apprenticeship, I had the two year commissioning workbook. So these workbooks can also help you, assist you within your application. So any evidence based application you work on or any previous workbooks is always good to use and utilize within your application for ING. I'm now a weapon system engineer within the weapon systems engineering group, primarily working on Type 23 frigates and some of the submarines. I'm just quickly going to touch on this at this stage of the presentation. Extracurriculum activities can also benefit your application. So such as involvement within the IET group itself, whether you be TMIET or MIET, so a member or a technical member, uh, voluntary work, charity activities, STEM activities, and inspiring the next generation, all good activities to aim and help and assist your application to become an incorporated or chartered or end tech professionally registered. So I'll move on to the UK spec. So the UK spec is something you need to use as your friend in your Bible. If you refer to it as basically the marking scheme, you're going to get assessed against. So imagine back at schools or university, you're taking exams. If you use the UK spec as basically the marking scheme, so you're writing your paper, answering the questions, and the mark skin scheme is next to you. So basically you refer for it point to point. So on the screen you can see there's competency A and it's got two different sections. So basically you need to be able to hit section one and then hit section two multiple times throughout your application. So always use the UK, mark, uh, UK spec throughout your application process. Read it at the start. It is very daunting, it is very long-winded with whichever activity or whichever professional registration you're going for. But it is there to aid and assist you. To so carefully read all three columns and think about examples, jobs and tasks that you've been set throughout your career that you could use and hit all these points. It's not necessarily the biggest job is the best one for the application process. Sometimes the small jobs actually cover a lot more of the UK spec going from start to finish of a task and having full control. So probably the best examples and what I certainly use for my application. So 
how I actually chose what examples I was going to use is I brainstormed and spider diagrammed an idea or a task I was had in my mind in the centre of the page. Off this diagram, I spidered it off and put each different competency to A to E on the diagram and then each one to two or one to four for each of the UK spec points and then made sure I had at least two to three points for each task and each UK spec point and then I did this for about four or five different tasks and then in the end I actually ended up picking the task I used so it's quite a good way to brainstorm and just get everything down on a piece of paper and understood. Also, throughout the process, you use the STAR technique, the situation, task, action, and result. IET are quite heavy in using STAR. I know here at Babcock, we also use STAR quite a lot. So definitely throughout your application, think of the situation you're in and the task you've undertaken. Then think about the task itself and what you actually need to do, the actions you need to take to get the task complete, and then the results. So the looking back and the reflection as well. One other point at this stage, especially within Babcock and security as a whole and defence, is consider the security rating of the task you're going to discuss during your application and then also on your interview itself. Um, it needs to make sure it's not ITAR and not uh, commercial and confidence, because obviously you don't want to be sharing that to people because the interviewers themselves are from other companies or retired. So you just need to be caution of being security rated, what you're actually saying on your application, because people vetting it aren't necessarily security cleared and commercial in confidence. OK, so for my application, there is two ways to do your application. You can do it via career manager or you can actually do a written application. The written application, I believe on last looking yesterday, is about £62 more expensive, roughly. So it's probably better to use the online tool of career manager once you're a member of the IET. So if you look in the top corner of the diagram there, there is perform professional profile. So if you start by going onto your professional profile and fill in all of your details, which is your name, your training records, including all your school qualifications, any universities, any extras such as IOSH or any other management qualifications, all look good and all add to your professional profile. But this professional profile then actually gets utilised and forms part of your application. So a good starting point, which is where I started, is complete your IET profile and complete the professional profile. You'll, you then move on to the page we're actually on now, where you say begin your press for professional registration journey. Sorry, my screen just flickered. Um, yeah, begin your press for begin your professional registration journey. So that is a tick box exercise to check that you are going to hit and assess yourself whether you're actually ready to uh, obtain and apply for CNG, ING, or ENG Tech. It's actually a very useful tool to show you the points you're strong on, the points you're weak on, and what you need to develop, or whether you're just ready. You can also speak to, like Sam said, PRAs and the IET themselves. So then you press the apply for professional registration. So the form itself covers a lot of responsibilities and achievements. You need to be more heavy on the achievement side. It used to be two separate boxes. It's now, I believe, one box. Be very explicit with what you are writing so be very very detailed indeed because this is more beneficial to the assessors the PRIs themselves and the UK or the IET application board let people read your application so as you're going through your application let your colleagues and fellows around you read your application because they actually may pick up on some points or extra points that you can put in and hit the UK spec as part of your application you have endorsement and supporters so the, these endorsement and supporters can be your boss your direct boss or line manager and ones you work with we're going to cover this again in a minute, but you will likely have one to two 
potentially more endorsements and supporters. If you are using a classified job, you will have more endorsements and supporters. So you lower the clarification or lower the security rating of what you actually send and the endorsement endorsements and supporters will verify what you're saying is true. Um, so going back to your application itself, part of your application is development action plan. We're going to take you through one of these or my example in a minute. Accountability diagram and then the professional registration advisors, the PRAs. The PRAs are there to help and support your application. They review it before you submit. Your PRA will then not become your assessor during the application process, nor will he become your interviewer, because obviously he's got an unfair advantage and unfair connection to you personally by this stage, because you've normally dealt and spoken to them quite a lot. Mine used to phone me up quite regularly throughout my application process. Your Endorsers and supporters, I forgot to say, don't have to be IET registered themselves. They can literally just be any of your bosses and managers. I know within Babcock there's quite a few that aren't necessarily professionally registered themselves and you're becoming professionally registered. So don't worry about using them to support your application. They don't need to be IET members. They can also be members of other institutes. Be open to constructive criticism about your application and perhaps being able to rewrite it a few times. I know I re rewrote mine a good few times to get all the points in the UK spec hit condensely and concisely, but also very detailed. Having you professionally registered also benefits your employers and your bosses because they can use it then to say they've got professionally registered people within their section which helps them gain future work and use for bids. I know that has been used within the section whether I'm in. Um, and electronically it is sent across from your endorsement and supporters. A note to point at this stage, don't send your application into your endorsement and supporters until you've finished and fairly happy with it because when you send it across it locks it. If you then go back and re-edit your application, your supporters have to resubmit what they've already written. So I suggest you let them save it onto a Microsoft Word, email it to you, or just get them to save it in case you end up having to go back into your application, because otherwise your supporters are going to have to redo their work. And also don't use acronyms throughout your application. As easy as it may be, and as much as it might be day-to-day -day words to you, especially the first stage of reviewing and not discipline specific reviewers. So don't use acronyms without first explaining. So on the screen now is my development action plan. The development action plan itself is a simple diagram, a simple document even, which is broken into short, medium and long term. It can be in a word format as you've seen in front of you, or it can be in a tabular format. So short term is one to two years, medium is three to four, and long term is five years plus. So basically what you've got to include within your development action plan is your career ambitions and inspirations, aspirations, your further learning you intend to commit to and intend to get. So whether this is on the job training from seniors, whether this is external courses, whether this is further degree work or short courses or longer term courses. How you're going to commit to your continual personal development, CPD, because IET have about a 30 hour a year ideal target. And any volunteering or inspiring you plan to do. So I put that I want to get involved within the IET community and do stuff such as what I'm doing today and also be part of the IET Young Network for Devon and Cornwall. So within your development action plan, you want to be realistic, but yet ambitious. It's not a complex di uh, document. It's a simple, short one page document covering all your plans and ambitions, basically. The next stage of the application is an accountability diagram. Accountability diagram is basically 
how you sit within the organization or within the section you work within. Obviously, I haven't gone flying up the route above my boss here, Hugh Redman, because I could go up a good few more levels. They don't need to see that. So I've done my AI accountability diagram in the way HR view our section, which isn't necessarily how we truly work. It looks like I have no direct reporters. In the HR time and attendance point of view, I don't. But on a day-to-day -day activity, we have the other engineers working for us and we work under the other engineers. We also have the fitters within our section working under us and for us when we need them to fix items for us. So we do have engineers working under you as part of the IET is your management for high engine C engine. So you have people working for you. You don't necessarily need them. And it's a misconception that seems to be going across because I thought this when I applied, I thought, oh, I haven't got any staff under me. But it doesn't actually match if you don't have any direct reporters from a HR point of view. If you manage, inform, set to work others on your behalf or set to work and lead the task, such as set to works or hats, etc. In my case, you don't need to have direct reporters. Um, so I did a simple Microsoft Word spider diagram here where you can see my name clearly in the middle. You can see my chain above me and to the side of me. I'm going to hand over to Sam quickly to take you through the start of this. Yep, so this slide here, um, for your information, endorsements and supporters. There are typically two types of uh, supporters that you would need to select for your incorporated chartered um, application. For those of you uh, applying for engineering technician status, I think you only ever need one, uh, as is true for incorporated and chartered status as well. However, from the PRAs that I've spoken to and the other candidates who've gone forward for incorporated and chartered engineer status, they have at least one and most commonly two or three supporters. Um, for your supporters, this could be anybody that you've known in your professional career, including those of you who've done an apprenticeship, um, your college lecturers or a member of staff at the college. And if you attended university, you might want to select your bachelor's or master's uh, dissertation supervisor. Um, similarly, if you've done any MVQs or sitting guilds qualifications um, to support your application, if those are qualifications that are over that have taken uh, at least two years, as you can see there, two or more years, you can also select those as supporters as well, as they would have known your professional development. Um, for those of you on this call who are consultants or you're working in an engine engineering consultancy firm or you are self-employed, uh, there is the option to add a supporter as a company or a person that you have provided consultancy services to as well. Uh, it really, it's anybody that you've had a professional relationship with who is able to give a written statement on your performance, either working for you or for them or working alongside you uh, in terms of your professional capacity, your day-to-day -day duties that you, that you would have undertaken and any technical problems that you would have had to solve throughout your, your professional career. Um, it does say down the bottom there, a second or third supporter is optional uh, and may be necessary. Um, this could be perhaps if you've undertaken a comment at, at another business for a, a significant period of time. I think the IET views it favorably if you could have a supporter from both the company that you've done a secondment from and uh, the company that you work for. I know that I personally have done a secondment and the IET fed back to me that that is something that they would like to see in terms of supporters just so that they could understand the major constituents of, of your application. Um, I think I've covered, John, John, I think I've covered anything that's on the slide and anything extra as well. Um, do, would you like to continue? Yep, I can carry on from here. The only thing I will add is when you send your application to your supporters, send them the UK spec itself. Let them write their reply in the form of the UK spec. So let them hit the points for you as well um, and get them to strongly agree with you, basically. Strongly support you. It looks better on your application. Obviously, you can't get them to lie, but you can get them to talk about you the best way. 
So I'll take you through the process timeline because this isn't really covered, nor is it something you can really see. Um, so you can use the IET Career Manager self checker, which I mentioned earlier. You can have got the written application or online. I strongly recommend you do the online version. It's much more simple. The process is much more slick and you can just email electronically all your applications across. You then move on to your professional registration advisor. I cannot commit to you enough how important these people are. Um, if you email the IET engagement officers, they will put you in contact with the PRA. They are always very helpful and their email addresses can be found on the IET website. Um, so yeah, once you've gone to your application, you have your PRA assess your application. If he makes any changes and you also put his name on your application. You then move forward to your supporters and endorsements and let them reply to your application. At this stage, you can then submit your application to the IET. What isn't really shown is the levels of checks within the IT itself. So the first stage of correcting, checking is non-specific discipline workers of the IET. So they might not necessarily be marine. I know my specialisms was marine and weapons. So they don't have somebody from checking applications at this stage from every single discipline within the electrical, electronic engineering and within the greater disciplines of the IET. So these are non-specific. They just check and look through that you've hit all the UK spec. This is actually quite a hard stage of the application and likely where you'll be pulled up for if you talk too much in acronyms. So I'm just going to cough. It's not COVID, promise. Um, so yeah, your application first goes into these non-Pacific discipline checkers. They check your application. If you're successful at this stage, it gets passed on to discipline specific checkers. So for me, it was weapons mainly. So if my application got passed to X WIOs and were two retired WIOs to look through and assess. When they were happy and checked it was all correct, um, they came back to me and let me through to the next stage was the interview. I'm just going to add one point into the first check. So if the non-Pacific discipline checkers pick up any points, they don't send your application back and make you submit the whole application again. What they send, send to you is a UK spec broken down sheet, which has got C1, C2, C3 for C criteria, A, B, C, D and E with one, two and three. And then for each one, two and three, you get 200 word limit and you have to add some extra detail in. Don't worry about this. It seems to be quite common. They normally pick you up on one thing or another. And I got picked up on one of the C points. So I just had to write some extra detail into the C um, criteria. Going back to the PRA. That's somebody trying to come. Coming into the room, sorry. Um, you go through to your professional registration interview. This is conducted with two discipline, well, a discipline specific person, more commonly now two discipline specific, which I'll come into in a minute. And then your application is successful. Well, the outcome of the PRA just go and gets fed into the engineering council review. So they take the discipline specific checkers notes and details about you, the application yourself, and then any feedback they get from the PRI. This all goes into the Engineering Council Review, which is a monthly meeting held, and they assess your criteria and your application, and then you get sent your outcome, whether you've been successful or not on this occasion. So the interview itself is currently, I believe, they are only holding Zoom calls. They started this during COVID, so I did a Zoom call approximately 12 months ago from there. And I was interviewed by two ex weapon engineering officers, two WIOs. And present during your interview is an IET PRI coordinator. So these introduce you at the start, introduce you to your interviewers, and also introduce themselves to you. So you will get to know each other informally at the start of your interview. They then take a back seat and allow the pass the interview over to the PRAs to take, which would be two or more 
special and specific interviews. It might be one if they can't arrange two to be conducted on the same day. They're preferring Zoom calls at present because they can put two people from wherever in the UK or whether, wherever in the world together to be your PRIs. and doesn't have to be uh, regionally specific like it used to be with the face-to-face -face interviews. So I actually seem to be preferring and Zoom calls seem to be staying for now. Your interviews should last approximately one hour. Um, mine ran over to about an hour and 15. So don't be afraid if it runs over. Your PRI coordinator will wrap the interview up. I know she butted in with us at about an hour and my interview has continued. Um, but don't worry, it's approximately one hour. There's two methods to your interview. You can either do 15 minutes presentation that might vary by now. I know they were on about maybe up in it, maybe down in the presentation itself, and then 45 minutes of questions. If you do the, the presentation without questions being asked you during your presentation, you are timed for your presentation to be to the minute of the presentation time gap. What I got told is allow them to ask you questions throughout your interview. You will get asked this at the very start of your interview, whether you're happy for questions to come at you throughout the whole PRA or whether they want them at the end of your uh, presentation. I will show you my presentation in a minute. But a tip to you is let them ask questions. You are then not timed for your presentational skills. And also they ask questions they want to hear the answers to. So you can move your presentation and be fluid with your presentation skills to adapt and answer what your PRIs want to hear. So they asked me to introduce myself during my interview and also my background, which I wasn't really expecting. So any hobbies and interests I have outside of work, which for me was quite easy because most of them are engineering related, whether it be agricultural and uh, automotive engineering outside of work. So don't be surprised to give the background and what you do outside of work and how this adds to your application is what you kind of do is it engineering the etc enjoy and be confident i can't say that enough for the interview you are on camera don't be phased by it the interviewers are all very knowledgeable and all they're trying to do is get you to pass and get the what they want to hear out of you they're not here to give you a grilling like you are for a job yes the interview is hard yes the questions can get chucked at you but don't worry about it um because if you can't answer a question they just answer, ask you the question in a different format or move on to a different question um you're up presentation, like it says on the screen, is mainly looking at criteria A and B of the UK spec and also criteria E5, which I'll cover and move on to in a minute after I show you my presentation. I used a PowerPoint with diagrams, photos and images to talk around throughout my presentation. My P the IET says no more than five slides for your presentation, but my PRA and speaking to a few other PRAs, they say you can have up to seven. Just see what your PRA says. Your PRA would also help you during your presentation. And he will review your presentation for you after you get successfully through to that stage. And I'll move on to, oh, the questions themselves can cover all of the UK spec. So this was my presentation, so simple introductory slide, which I talked and introduced myself. I then moved on to, to and two examples I actually used. So one was a GSE 8 gun system automation op def operation defect that I fixed here within Devonport on the gun system and the EOD that you can see on the screen there. So how I use STAR approach, so how I went to the task, how I used the situation, the task, the action, and the view points to overcome and rectify, rectify and solve this defect, which seemed to be an ongoing defect that many people had previously looked at. So how I diagnosed it, the stages of rectification. So it's, this slide itself is quite short, quite condensed, but it allows me to talk around it to the interviewers themselves. Also, because I allowed questions, they could pick up the points on the screen and elaborate further. So make sure what's on the screen you're kind of happy with and happy to talk through. I included some diagrams 
simple schematics to be able to talk around. I obviously couldn't use the actual drawings because they were official sensitive. And I just used a basic diagram with this, which shows you the layers of communications and also the image just to show the points of what I meant by certain items, because some equipment we work on is very Navy specific and some of it's also older technology, not necessarily what you talk at uni. So if you get a younger assessor, they might not know what you're talking about. So that was that slide. Or a tip for the presentation, the PRI, is use some cue cards or a separate screen, a second computer for your notes. Um, I know I used that and it did aid me. So I used one was a work application, a work job for my presentation. The other one was actually my university project because it covered some of the other UK spec points and showed a broad range of engineering from fixing it and also from concept to final product, which was my university project was, which was a monitoring system, as you can see on the screen. And again, I just showed some images of the final project. So this is probably the hardest part of the presentation is they ask you to show an E5 example. E5, as you can see on the screen there, is understand the ethical issues that may arise in their role and carry out the responsibility in an ethical manner. Of course, for my work, they love that because I got the question of how do I feel regarding the ethics of my job, including the end of purpose of what I do and what it is there for. I work on the system that controls guns and weapons. So obviously it is used for war purposes and deterrence. So I had to answer the question of how I thought that was ethically correct. So obviously I had to turn around and say, well, it's used by the Navy, the Navy are trained. They're not going to be lighthearted or trigger happy. And we'll do it for the correct purposes and the correct reasons for the security and defence of the British nation or Great Britain. So expect some curveball questions. I was not expecting a question along those lines. Um, but also you can refer back to the Royal Academy Engineering of Ethics Principles, which I recommend you read and any of your company's code of practices. For me, it was Babcock. So make sure before you do your PRI, you read Babcock Code of Practice and be able to state a few lines out of it or have it in front of you on the desk. And the same with the Engineering Ethics Principles. So that's come to the end of my presentation. Now I will happily answer any questions. I believe Sam is going to fire them at me. Yep. So um, I'll just uh, leave some time uh, for somebody to type a few questions into the chat box if you have any. Um, alternatively, uh, John's got our contact information on the screen there. If you'd like to drop uh, Jonathan a question relating to um, his experience or his, his IENG application or if there's any clarification or detail that he can uh, potentially share about his application, uh, I'm sure it'd be open to an email. Uh, likewise, if you're interested in yourself presenting um, at an IET, IET Devon and Cornwall seminar or you're interested in getting involved in some of the IET Devon and Cornwall events that we're running, if you'd like to be part of the organisation of those, which does contribute to your um, professional registration application as it demonstrates um, competencies in leadership, management, um, uh, explaining technical subjects to those that may not be so technical, uh, feel free to drop me an email as well. So um, I'll just leave the chat box open for the next couple of minutes. If you've got any questions you'd like me to field to John, please fire them away. Um, if not, uh, thank you very much for attending. I've got an attendee list um, in uh, as part of this presentation. So for those of you that have attended, I'll send you a CPD certificate that you'll be able to submit as part of your continual professional development for your professional registration application. Um, we've got one question in here. So John, just to field this to you, have you come across the potential trap of not being able to move up to chartership once you're incorporated? I've heard that once you're I-Eng, it's hard to keep moving up towards C-Eng. 
I actually, as soon as I got INs, got approached by PRIs down here and got told when did I want to apply for CNG and when did I want to start my application. So it seems to be open. I haven't moved into it yet because I was just going to let myself develop within my career for a few more years before going towards chartership. Um, but I don't believe that is a problem because I've been contacted on a few occasions now about did I want to start my application and yeah basically didn't want to start my application so they don't seem to be holding me back from being able to apply for it. No I can also vouch for that as well in that I become uh, I became EngTech registered on completion of my apprenticeship ooh, five five years ago now which makes me feel old um, and I got I got the same emails from IET Central asking me when I would consider further education to pursue my ch chartership application, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, if anything, David, um, getting ING and then moving on to CNG further strengthens your CNG application because you've already demonstrated a lot of the competencies already. Um, so I, I would say, if anything, it strengthens your application. Uh, just to confirm, you don't need to be incorporated engineer before you go for chartered engineer, or you don't need to be chartered before you become incorporated. Um, that one does not come, does not have to come before the other. It's just whether you're interested in in backing up your current competencies with uh, a registration category that that matches. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, Terry Foster asked if I could send out the full presentation after um, after this Teams call. Yep, Terry, this um, the, we're recording this presentation. John will uh, audit the presentation to make sure he's happy with the content of it, and then it will go on the IET Devon and Cornwall YouTube channel. Um, I can email that link out once it is uploaded next week, or if you just type into YouTube IET Devon and Cornwall, you you'll you'll find the channel there. Um, whilst I wait for any more questions, I'll just get the YouTube link if people would like to have a look at our previous seminars. Um, two seconds. Was there anything you think I should further elaborate on, Sam, whilst we still got most of the audience? No, I think, John, you've, you've covered absolutely everything brilliantly. Um, I think what sets your presentation apart from most other um, professional registration presentations is it was fantastic that you gave your personal experience and shared with us your application tips, what your... Um, what your uh, inter, uh, what your presentation looks like, what your accountability diagram looks like, I think that really dispels uh, some of the myths or or puts some people at ease as, as to what they should be submitting for for a professional registration application. Um, PRAs do an excellent job at advising and guiding. But uh, as anybody who's been through a, a, any college course or any uni course, you always like to compare notes with your, your friends as to after a lecture to make sure that you all got the same sort of conclusion that the lecturer was talking about. So I think, no, I think you covered er everything about your personal experience brilliantly. Thank you. That's right. I will also say to everybody listening is the applications all vary. So everybody's application is slightly different. So what you've seen today of mine doesn't mean that's the be all end all, the correct way to do it. You can do it in other formats. So don't be put off if your application, if you're writing your application at present, looks slightly different. It doesn't matter as long as it contains the content they want to see. Brilliant. If we've got no further questions, I'd like to thank you one last time for attending. If you've got any questions, drop John and I an email and we look forward to meeting you at the next Devon and Cornwall local network seminar or event. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Thank you. Cheers all. Thank you. Bye.